There are many ways to greet someone, be it with the English good evening, the Swiss grüezi, or the French bonsoir. But I would like to use an international way of greeting, and that is the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Translated, peace be upon you. Well, first let me introduce you myself. My name is Nala Nabi, and I'm the president of the Muslim Students Association of Zurich. And it is an honor and pleasure for me to welcome you in the name of our association. I want to extend a special welcome to our invited guests and to the representatives of the media and first and foremost to our speakers of today, Professor Michel Heigalna and Professor Tariq Ramadan. Well, I really have to say that it is nicely full here and I see many unfamiliar faces. And I know some of you must be in total shock because here I'm standing here in front of you, a Muslim woman in a Swiss, at a Swiss university. And I just greeted you in the name, with the name, with the greeting of peace. And um, I'm sorry that I didn't force you to sit separately. Sorry I didn't fulfill your expectations. Anyway, thank you all very much for attending this evening. We are very blessed to be able to organize such an event at the university. And to have the Oxford University professor here. And more than that, have, having here the university's rector, Professor Michael Hengat, just like I told before, who is supporting us and who will be in charge giving a welcome speech. Thank you very much for being here. For, uh, for being here today, <laughs> and thanks to the university who has given us this pretty good opportunity. I'm sorry. <laughs> but first, first, I asked you to come here. I want to just give a quick overview of what's going to happen this evening. <laughs> First, I want to introduce our association, and then I want to give you a short introduction of our rec of the university's rector, Professor Michael Hengartner, and then he will give a short welcome speech. Afterwards, I will introduce to you Professor Tariq Ramadan, and then his lecture will begin. And afterwards, there will be a short Q and A session if we have enough time. And then basically we will be at the end. Now let me talk to you about our association. Our association was established one and a half years ago by students from all around the world. And as you can see on this uh, picture, that is the international flag of the world. And this is uh, a symbol to show you that diversity is one of our main goals. And as a good example, you even can see from our board, we are board members from all around the world, like our board now, to, now exists from, uh, the board members are from Switzerland, Germany, India, Pakistan, Egypt, Albania, and Turkey. Everyone is always welcome to our association, may be a religious person or a non-religious person, may be a practicing person or non-practicing person, Everyone is always welcome, irrespective of creed, gender, or nationality. We have done lots of activities so far, and just last month we have a famous Islamic, uh, Islamic speaker, Duma Ali Khan, at the university, and that was until now our biggest, biggest event so far, and really a good, really an unforgettable experience. And even the Swiss media called him a tolerance prediger, in English tolerance preacher, and they were really impressed from us. And we do also other events like at the, at the beginning of every semester we organize semester welcome opera to meet and greet new students. Then we have the interreligious dialogue with the students, Muslim Bible group. And we also had an eat party, and soon we are going to have a grill party or a picnic 
and all the information you can find from our website or you can follow us on, uh, on Facebook. And another announcement I would like to say is that we are going to have on the 9th of May an event with the, Muslim, uh, with the Christian Bible group and there we are going to cook with them together and have dinner with them. So all the information you can find from our website. Another important thing I would like to share with you is that organizing such events has never been so easy. Indeed, we keep, the, keep this events free, all, our, all of our events are free, so the maximum people can join us. Next, we would also like to say that we don't get any fundings from the university or any other organizations for our events. There is just a small membership fee. And other than that, we bear the expense from our own pockets and through your generous donations. Please help us in making such events possible by generously donating at the exits when you leave the lecture hall at the end. So, now I want to introduce to you uh, the university's professor, Michael Hengartner. Michael Hengartner, he is a Swiss Canadian citizen who was born in St. Gallen. Switzerland in 1966, and grew up in Quebec City, Canada. He studied biochemistry at the University Laval in Quebec City after earning his PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with Nobel laureate H. Robert Horwitz. He was head of research group at the Cold Spring Harbor. And um, once again, sorry. He, he was head of a research group at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in the USA from 1994 to 2001. In 2001, he was appointed professor for molecular biology at the newly created Ernst Hadam Chair at the Institute of Molecular Life Sciences, University of Zurich. From 2009 to 2014, he acted as Dean of the Faculty of Science. Michael Hengartner holds an executive MBA from IMD Lausanne and is the recipient of several awards for his groundbreaking research in the molecular basis of apoptosis. Among them, the Swiss National Lexus Prize. In 2010, he was awarded the Credit Swiss Award for Best Teaching at the University of Zurich. I would like now to ask Mr. Professor Michael to take over and say the words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, there's many ways to greet. The way I normally greet is by saying, hi, I'm Michael. <laughs> As you heard, my name is Michael Hingarner. I'm currently president of the University of Zurich. Uh, the Muslim Student Association of Zurich, who is organizing tonight's presentation, um, asked me to say a few introductory uh, words to the topic of tonight's talk, uh, Active Students Shaping a Better World from the point of view of our university. The topic of student participation is very important to me and therefore I agree to do so. Why should students bother to take time to get involved in shaping a better world? Should they not focus their attention on studying, getting their degree? Isn't that why they're at the university? Why should the university care whether they're students or participating? in making a better world, in being active? The first question is relatively easy to answer. Students, you should be involved in making a better world, in shaping a better world, because it will be your world. Any decision taken now will affect you much more than it will affect me. It will affect me much more than it will affect my mother. The younger you are, the bigger your interest, your stake, in making sure that the world improves. 
Due to this, and perhaps also due to the fact that young people are full of energy and often lack experience, which means that they're not cynical yet or disappointed from life, um, young people tend to be open to change and willing to put a lot of efforts into um, making changes that will make them work. One very positive example of what students can do when they get their minds to it um, was the Sustainability Week that we had both here at the University of Zurich and at our sister institution, ETH Zurich, um, at the beginning of last month. This is the second time that we had this Sustainability Week. Uh, and it was a huge success. It was organized by students. Uh, the sustainability committee of our student organization, the VWS Utset Hub. And I know how much energy they put into this. They really put in a huge amount of preparation, thought process, execution. They did it because they believe in what they do. They were rewarded with strong student participation, widespread positive equal, but also a university which started realizing that this was an important issue. They started catalyzing new activities in the various faculties. So what was initially a student event is now the university-wide event. All right, so you might say, okay, well, if I were the idealist, I'd do something, but you know what? No, I'm an egoist. I, I just care about myself, and therefore I prefer to spend my time collecting ECTS points and getting my degree. After all, that's what students should be at universities for. Well, no, dear egoists, I tell you, for the sake of your own education, for your own sake, you should also be active as a student, try to make a better world. Now, why would that be? For that, we need to take a step back and start asking ourselves, what is the actual ultimate goal of an education? Sure, you'd say, well, get a degree. No, so why do you get the degree? Well, no, I want a job. Is that really all? Is the function of the university to create people ready for jobs. We think there's more to it. We're convinced that getting a university education means becoming a critical mind. We want our graduates to be critical thinkers, people who can take a complex problem and ask themselves, hmm, is there already an answer to this complex problem? If yes, where can I find this answer? How good is this answer? Is it believable? Does it actually apply to my particular problem? If there is no answer, how do I find an answer to this complex problem? How do I communicate this complex problem? Is this answer to, to my peers, to my colleagues, to society at large? We're convinced that this is fundamentally what we should be trying to do. And I'm convinced that unless we are successful at doing that, we're not fulfilling the mandate that we're getting from the government and from society. Now the challenge with this idea of becoming critical thinkers is that it's not an easy thing. We need time, we need to effort. Nobody has become a critical thinker just because he collected 180 credit points. It takes more. So what does it take? From my own experience, I can tell you that one very good way to learn how to become a critical mind is to be in a team and try to do something really difficult where everybody has to put in their brains, their minds, their hearts. If you do that, I'm convinced you will rapidly learn how to address complex problems successfully. So, in essence, all of you out there who are taking time off from your studies to be active as students to try to improve the world, let me reassure you, you're actually working on your education while you're away from your studies. Because by trying to improve the world, by trying to solve complex problems, you're actually learning to become a critical thinker, one of the key goals of a university education. So, idealists and egoists alike, go out there and be active. If you're not doing it for the others, do it for yourself. I think now you also understand why the University of Zurich cares whether its students are active and contribute to the world. Basically, we see ourselves as having two mandates. We have a research mandate where we try to generate new knowledge. 
And when we find knowledge that is relevant to society, we have a mandate to transfer that knowledge to society. At the, at the education level, we have a mandate to generate critical minds. Both knowledge transfer and critical mind building are greatly enhanced when students together think actively how they can use their knowledge and know, use their know-how to solve a concrete societal problem. Student participation, in a nutshell, is a win-win for the students and for society. Let me finish with a few words about tonight's speaker. I realize he will be introduced afterwards. Let me just in a very brief shell, nutshell tell my side of it. From what I could learn from you, uh, we don't know each other that well yet. But five minutes, you know, it's better than nothing. <laughs> Tariq Ramadan is Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at the University of Oxford. He is a very prolific author and speaker. And he's been labeled by Times Magazine as one of the world's 100 most influential people. That's not something I can say of myself. <laughs> I have other qualities, I think you're sure. <laughs> My wife loves me very much, nevertheless. <laughs> Ramadan's interests focus on the question, as far as I could understand, of whether the Islamic faith is compatible with the values of Western society, such as Islam. Ramadan answers this question with a definitive yes. He, in fact, insists that Muslims living in this Western society must see themselves not only as a religious Muslim, but also as citizen of this country, and must take an active part in the life and development of that country. And I assume this emphasis on participation is the link that led to the MSA said to invite Mr. Ramadan to talk about student participation, because I assume that his student days are also over for a few years now. Professor Ramadan is a controversial person. Many people praise him, seeing in him a bridge between Islam and Western culture. Many others criticize him. Some see him as a dangerous agitator, a wolf in sheep clothes. Others still chastise him for being too ambiguous. They see him as a chameleon, trying to say to each audience what they want to hear. Many finally are upset by statements that he has made in the past, and which they interpret as condoning practices that are completely incompatible with our Western society culture and our legal frameworks. This controversy has drawn attention from the media. As mentioned, we have ladies and gentlemen from the press. Please do smile at them, be nice to them. <laughs> um, we're guests. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want them to say nasty things about us. Welcome very much, ladies and gentlemen from the press and from the media. Now, a question that I was asked is why does the university allow controversial people to speak at a public institution like the University of Zurich? It's not necessarily because we agree with their views. I, in fact, uh, profoundly disagree with some of the statements that I read from Professor Ramadan. And I know that Professor Ramadan will respect my rights to disagree with him. It's also not because we desperately need publicity. Tom knows that the University of Zurich had enough publicity in the last couple of years, <laughs> even if it was mostly for a bunch of dusty bones. I'll explain to you later. <laughs> the key reason, the key reason that the University of Zurich allows controversial scientists, controversial intellectuals to give a talk at the university is because it is part of our mandate. The goal of the university system is to first generate new knowledge and second to build critical minds. Both processes require the freedom to also discuss issues where there is no consensus. We need the freedom for speakers to present their own, possibly controversial view, their view of the truth. If we only allow consensus views to be presented at our university, if we only navigate known waters, we will never <laughs> find new lemons, we will never discover new continents. And in this spirit, I encourage you to see tonight's talk as an opportunity for you to train your critical skills. Take out your analytical tools, prepare them, use them, and decide for yourself whether the speaker's argument are logical, whether they are convincing, 
and whether they are compatible with your own ideas and your own values. If you do that, I am sure that you'll be a step further towards becoming a critical thinker. And in this spirit, I wish us all an informative and stimulating evening. Thank you. I try to keep to my 
45 minutes in order for you to have time to ask questions and to uh, use your critical thinking by asking the questions that are uh, uh, worrying you. If we look at the world today, if we think about the way it is, uh, let us start with something which is apparently simplistic and at the end is critical. Is that to look at the world the way it is and to assess the world, say, when you are facing a world where you woke up in the morning and you go to sleep in the evening and 150,000 people are dying out of starvation, there is something wrong. When today, where we are in the 21st century, uh, you have in the West, in Europe, in our country, but not only, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, Something that we can compare to new slavery, that our people have less value, that we can buy and sell people. And some who are, uh, in fact, preparing uh, dresses and clothes for us are paid less than one dollar per day. And we are paying the same clothes uh, 200 times the price. There is something wrong in the way we are dealing. Where we see today, it's as if there is something which is normalized in our media. And once again, I read the journalists. Uh, because I, I talk to the journalists as citizens. First, they are citizens before becoming they are being journalists. And sometimes some of the, our uh, journalists are forgetting that they are citizens and they have responsibility before just covering things. And the problem is that with uh, uh, the media coverage, the globalization of the world is as if today, when you deal with people, we have a variety of, uh, 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 when it comes to people. African people when they die, Asian people when they die, Syrian people when they die, 200 per day today. In Africa, we are, uh, the, 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 the figures are just unbelievable. It's as if this is normal lives, and the, 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 the life of some people has less value than the life of others. When this is normalized, there is something wrong in our world. So it's as if we just are used to this. On my way coming here, while I was uh, listening to the radio, uh, you have some countries that are teaching us human rights. And a, a, a human being, to, it took them 45 minutes of suffering before he was killed out of uh, a, 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 the death penalty in the United States of America. Because they didn't have the right prior to kill him. And then you have also psychological torture in the best country, in the most industrialized country. Our countries, what you have, for example, in the States today, solitary confinement for people, and you know that you are losing all your milestones, and, and uh, after four days, they are there for five years. And some of them, they don't know why they are there. And if you look now, it's not to criticize the States, we come to the Muslim majority countries, we come to the Asian countries, everywhere the same. That there is something wrong with our world. So if you look at this, you can sit down and say, you know what, I'm in Switzerland, very nice country, let me get my degree, my PhD, and that's fine, the way you are putting it. If you do look at this, and you look at the world, at one point you have to take a decision, but this is your decision, the way you can take it for you. You find your place in this world, or you change this world for the better. This is a position of principle. No one can uh, decide. So, so the discussion, no one can decide about your stuff with this. It means, and this is the third point, that when we have such a topic, what is behind the topic? It's a certain concept of life. That this life has meaning. And the meaning is, yes, you are here for your own sake, but you are here to serve humanity. So there is a philosophy of life. And it's not coming from one religion. It could come from ages. It could come from agnosticism. It could come from Hinduism, or Buddhism, or Judaism, or Christianity, or Islam. That's not the point. The point is a concept of life. That you think that your role in this life is, yes, I have to think 
of myself that I have to show solidarity and to change the world for the better. So this is the meaning that you give to your life. And you look at your involvement into studying out of this understanding of this is my life, this is who I want to be in this world. So and this is once again something which is important why. Because from the very beginning, before talking about the diversity of our philosophy, let us come to the common understanding of life. Life is protect yourself, serve others. If you listen to anybody around the world, when you get this, you get this is, yes, I feel attracted by this. Because it's talking to my heart, it's talking to my mind, and it's a philosophy of life. And this is where, instead of being divided on details, let us come together on fundamentals. Because the world needs mass agreeing on the fundamentals. Because the poor people are poor and dying because we keep on struggling on details and not coming on the fundamentals. So I think that this is the starting point. What meaning you give to your life? Are you here? Uh, uh, in an, a very egoistic, <coughs> egocentric way, how are you here to serve? And once again, sitting here in this room, very quickly we say, yes, I feel that this is the meaning I want to give to my life as students, as human beings, because all the students are human beings and this is something which we have to start with. But to go from thinking of it to implementing it, this is where uh, uh, it's critical, and this is what I want to tackle. So, for me, when I'm asked about an active student, as it is in the title, for me, it's a pleonasm. It's something which is repeating the same thing. By definition, for me, a student is active, should be intellectually active and uh, socially active. And I'm saying something which is the starting point for me. When you think you are active, when you try to build an understanding of the world or sciences or whatever, this is intellectual activity. So to be now active and how do you use this knowledge in the world to change it for the better, it's not active. But by definition, I don't I don't understand how the students could be passive. Even though I have seen so many. <laughs> in the way they are dealing, and then this is the obsession of the degree, and be careful, it's, it's the way you deal with knowledge, and the way we celebrate knowledge could be also tricky and misleading. Now, having said that, let me come to uh, the starting point of impact. When we are talking about students, what we refer to is getting knowledge. It has to do with education and training. We have in different languages, for example, in, in French or in Arabic, we have very clear distinction between two words, education and what we call training. Or, or it's not as clear as education and instruction, uh, which is in Arabic also, we have the same difference in the Semitic language, is it it's the way you educate, it's shaping the behavior and transmitting knowledge. And what we are expected to do as, as university professors or within our schools is transmitting knowledge. And we think that the educational side should be done by the parents, the family. While we know now that, uh, and this is something that is obvious, that uh, Whatever is your role as somebody who transmits knowledge, in fact, you transmit a behavior. The way you are with the knowledge that you have at every level, from primary to university level. Now, uh, the point for me is uh, to come to this knowledge and to have a critical take on that. Where I would say within our uh, universities, what we are trying to get is this knowledge and not we have to question is the way we deal with knowledge in our world today because this is where the students have a role to play. So uh, the first thing that I was saying at the beginning, the background with which I started is to say, look, on the fundamentals, on the fundamentals of what humanity should, should be, our goals is to uh, uh, first educate ourselves and then to serve humanity. 
uh, it's something that the starting point is the common goals at the starting point entering within academia you should be equipped with one principle and the principle is to acknowledge the fact there is something that we call the uni unity of humanity which for me it's essential it's to start with this that while you can say in one country we are brothers and sisters in this country which is for example what you get in some uh, uh, slogans and reference to some country if you can say this within the religious community you can say that you are my brothers and sisters in Christianity, in Judaism, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Islam first you are my brother and sisters in humanity that's the point, the starting point of everything which is going to build and you are going to build upon as people who are getting knowledge so the knowledge should be based on the unity of humanity. A university has to do with the universal, and the universal has to do with our common humanity. And there is no hierarchy. By saying this, black, white, rich, poor, no difference. But when we face racism, no hierarchy. There is no one racist that is less dangerous than another. All the races are to be but this is coming from our understanding, the starting point of our discussion. And when we enter academia, this is something that we have to build because this is rational, this is where we can come together. So I would like students, I would like to see students starting with this, which is human brother and sister, by the way. Just to make it clear that we start with this. And having said this, it's in the name of this common dignity that we come to something which is essential. When you enter the realm of university, you understand also that this unity will never remove diversity. Look at this room. This is Switzerland, by the way. For some of the, our populist parties, they have some problems at looking at this room. <laughs> because it's too diverse. It's not our colors. And yet you say, I'm sorry, this is Switzerland. With all the colors, our unity, is based on our deep understanding that the unity of humanity is based with the, on the diversity of cultures, religions, and origins. That's the starting point of our philosophy of life. Within academia, I'm not talking about our singularity, so talking here about the fact that this is the starting point of the discussion. Why? Because getting this from the very beginning means that students should be accountable. Are you working for the, the unity of humanity accepting a diversity of cultures, religions, and visions, and understanding. No critical thinking if you don't start with this. What is your critical thinking? What are you going to criticize if you don't start with fundamentals on which there is something which is important? This is why I'm saying, you know, I wrote a book called The Quest for Meaning, and I was saying, I would like all the students to reconcile with four disciplines. The first one is history, because we are losing his memory. The second is knowledge of philosophy, the big questions. Why? Why are you doing what we are doing? Third is knowing religions and spirituality, because we live in a global world with diversity. And the fourth one, which was surprising for many of the people, is arts and imagination. We need to reconcile ourselves with art, because there is a lack of creativity. We end up repeat the world culture, is a world culture of imitation much more than a world culture of creativity in the deep sense. That's not the point. I come back to my, uh, 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 my topic here is to say let us start with the fundamentals. Now, what it means here is that when you come to knowledge and education, when you come to university and students, you get the knowledge you have fundamentals, the unity of humanity, the diversity of all the cultures, civilizations and society. And then you ask yourself, okay, what am I going to do with my knowledge? Whatever is your knowledge, human sciences or experimental sciences or exact sciences. This is where the knowledge should be used for something. You have a duty towards uh, what you are uh, 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 trying to get. There is something that we know now. It's the more we get knowledge, the more we are facing with something which is a challenge for any scholar, any professor, any uh, body who is uh, specialized in the field, which is the complexification of knowledge. 
And this is why we have more and more students specialized in one very specific field. Because it's so complex that you have to be very specialized. And this is normal, and this is problematic. It's challenging. Because the more you are specialized as to the know-how in your field, the less you have time to ask the big question, what am I doing? Remember Einstein? At the end, asking himself, if I had known that this was going to be used to destroy people, I would have had a, a second. Meaning, so specialized in a complex world that at the end, you get a deep knowledge in that field, but not the big question for humanity. The question means here that you have to reconcile this complexification of knowledge. And in this question, as students, whatever is what you study, whatever is the field, philosophy, human sciences, and, and sciences in, in medical science and bioethics. Recently, we have a very deep discussion on ethics and bioethics. And we are challenging some of the people who are very, very sharp in their field. At the end, there is a big question. Even, for example, when you speak, for example, very easily you speak about something which is, you know, organ donation. Of course, we, we should push for that. And then you go deep and you get the sense where some people are telling you, medical doctors, you know what? Sometimes we are in a situation where the economic pressure on us is so intense that for economic reasons, we are challenging the way we have to deal with human life. By defining what, for example, brain death, when somebody is dead. So you have a complex dimension. You can just take one by saying, I'm for that, and not getting the interaction. This is a complexification of knowledge. If you don't have what I was talking about in the beginning, unity of humanity, and then diversity, you have to deal with this, you are getting something which is be specialized in your so very effective, but sometimes less human as to the questions that you are putting. Less concerned with humanity. Very sharp in that field, but not very deep as to the global perception. And we have too many students now, they want a degree, very sharp, and then you ask them why. The question is, why? What do you want to do with this? Degree, money, salary? All of them would say, oh no, it's bigger than that. <laughs> It's very big, <laughs> indeed. But at the end, you see that the questions are not here. So this complexification of knowledge is coming back to us. You, as students, all of us as human beings, to be a subject. A subject means to get the knowledge and to take the decision as a subject. And not as a victim. Not as somebody who can say, like Goebbels said, I had no conscience, my conscience was hidden. He had a conscience, and he decided not to have. And all the students have a conscience. Consciousness is the starting point of everything, and then you have to be subject. Universities should produce subjects. People who can think by themselves. If not, there is no point. If not, you are not a student, you are a parent. You repeat what is said to you to get the degree. And you know what? Many students are like this. Very good at that. I repeat and I get it. Why? Well, a university is not about this. It's about critical thinking. It's about questioning. It's about challenging. So here we have here subjects who are responsible and then who are accountable. And then we add the last thing that I was having at the beginning, serving people. Subject, meaning autonomous. They think I get something. Even in the religious field, by the way, anyone who comes to me in, within the religion, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and say, I got this from them, is not a subject. He's a follower. He's imitating, or she's imitating. That's wrong. Critical thinking in every field is the essence of human autonomy as a subject. So you have the subject, responsible, accountable, and serving. Serving humanity. So it's the way you use this. So as students, we come with this, and what it means here is that we have to qualify knowledge. And it comes as active students, and I will say four things about the knowledge here is what uh, uh, we are uh, facing. First, what 
once again, whatever is your faculty, whatever is your choice, whatever is your area of specialization, there is something that should be deep and structured knowledge. Deep and structured knowledge, and once again, as somebody who is a Muslim coming from the reference, but having studied the Greek philosophy, having studied and went to sit with, uh, I know it's not in Wikipedia, that, uh, 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 to stay with the Dalai Lama for weeks and to try to understand how it is that he is so disciplined with his son, you know, is perceived an, ex an exotic figure. At 4 o'clock every day in the morning, he repeat the text and he try to get the essence of it. There is something here which is deep and structured knowledge, where what I got from my tradition is that God likes when somebody is getting knowledge or competence that has a good comment on the competence. You need to, be, um, to, to, to try as much as you can to get it right, to master what you are doing. You get this in Hinduism, you get this in all the spiritual, you know, there is no spirituality without discipline, and there is no critical thinking, and there is no science without discipline. A scientist is disciplined. Spiritual life is about discipline. Even art. When you listen to a pianist, the way he can play, and sometimes you say, wow, it's so natural. Behind this, hours of mastering the technique, to give you the impression that there is no technique. <laughs> That's the point. Behind it, master, discipline, painting. Remember, Picasso said, it takes a long time to become young. <laughs> because, because when he was 16, when you went to go to look at the painting, mastering everything. Working very hard to get that. And it's only after 30 years that he was painting as a child. But as a child, was out of mastery. The mastery was out of discipline. No art, no religion, no science was in discipline, meaning deep knowledge and structural knowledge. And this is why if you come here in a university, it's not to get a degree first, it is to get a culture of discipline and structural knowledge, deep knowledge. Why? Why is it so important? You know one of the, 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 the international disease that we have within globalization? is populism. You know what is populism? Populism is to make you think, not with your mind, but with your fear and God. That in fact populism is about two things. Very simplistic question, answer to very deep question. You are facing unemployment, I have the answer. It's them. Immigrants. They are the danger. The very old racist is coming back. And we are all facing this. You know why we don't have a, a, a job? You know why Switzerland is in danger? Damn. It's first this binary vision of reality. Second is, as I was saying, the binary vision, and second, simplistic question to complex issues. An employment economic crisis is there. So very simplistic. Remove them from the picture and we get the solution. The third uh, feature of populism today is about victim mentality. We are the victims of whom? Death! They are coming, entering, colonizing. And then I, I, I said this very often. I was facing the, the spokesperson for the UDC. In, in, in uh, uh, Geneva, and he, he looked at me and said, you know what, Harry Ramadan made a mistake with you. So we, just, we gave you the nationality. <laughs> <laughs> in his mind, my passport was a problem because I was dead. But when dead becomes one of us, wow, that's the danger. <laughs> this is populism. You don't think with your mind, we think with, and this is the fourth feature of populism is emotional politics. You deal with emotion. Where do you think are we going to get the resistance, or we should get the resistance to emotional politics, simplistic answer to complex question, the verse us versus them, and then this victim mentality, where, where we teach the students to be 
subject, responsible, accountable, and getting money. This is where you, the, the resistance to populism is a space where we think. Not, the, 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 not to be colonized by populists, but to have thinkers, critical minds, getting out of university and resisting something which is a disease. And by the way, it's not only in Switzerland, it's not only in Europe. Go in the Middle East, go in Africa, you have populists everywhere. In India, now, listen, it's just, it's worrying. It's a world where the global media, not because the journalists are not doing the job, but by the very essence of global media, when you are on the social networks, you can produce and nurture populism. Who is going to resist? We need students, and this is the first intellectual responsibility. An active student resists with his mind or her mind. If not, what is the point? But a populist student is a problem. <laughs> Because it's that literature. Anyway, I don't want to go to this, but this is it. This is important. Now what I said, and this is where we come and we understand our responsibility. And once again, what I'm saying is whatever is your field, whatever is your field. Because somebody who is studying you know, exact sciences or uh, physics or biology or medical science and, uh, uh, and, and ending up obsessed with this and not getting this could be the prey of any of this trend if the, the, the vision is not open and I will come to this. The second point which is important here is that as I said, we are talking here about let me tell, tell me how much time do I have still? Because I can take a uh, long time. I still have plenty? Good. You, you, you do like this when it's done. Okay, the, the point here is that I was saying that the background, the, the, the backdrop of all this, common humanity and the diversity. Now, look at this. You are in the university. How much time do you allocate, not only to structure your mind in uh, uh, talking about the unity of humanity, but the diversity of cultures and religions, at the end, at the end, you will never be open-minded if you only open your mind. You know, it's not, oh, I'm open, you know, you have people who say, oh, yes, I'm open-minded. I'm open. And you look at the, the surrounding, they are open-minded with always the same people. So it's very close to open-mindedness. <laughs> it's always the same people. <laughs> and we look at this university. I'm sorry, one of your responsibility as students in a university, when you have students coming, this is an international university, by the way. In Switzerland, you are coming from everywhere. Even your president is coming from Canada, isn't it? And that's it. And I'm coming from from Switzerland, from Geneva. If I were where? From Geneva. Not so far. I was born and raised here. Okay? When you are in a university and look at the diversity of culture, this is why we need mutual knowledge. Mutual knowledge is about knowledge. We need knowledge. Once again, look at all the spiritualities. If you come to what is common in Islam, is that we made you nations and tribes in order for you to know each other. This is a verse. You find it in all the traditions. And now come to humanism, come to Aristotle, come to Socrates, come to Plato, come to atheists, Marx, and whoever you want. There is one point which is necessary. You want to live together, it's going to be out of mutual knowledge. Mutual knowledge means know yourself. You know one of the main problems that I have in Switzerland? It's not that the people are scared of me. Some are. <laughs> it's not that the problem. It's that they are scared of me at the level of their own ignorance of themselves. So when you come and you see somebody who seems to be confident with who he is, and you are not, it's scary. So, mutual knowledge means know yourself and know the other. But it means challenge. You have students. So, the, the knowledge in a university is not only professors and students, it's students, students. It's you. It's, it's about you. It's to take time to get this. 
you know, I was always used because of when I was young, I was uh, playing football at a high level. And very often, you know, I was one of the only, apparently, not so Swiss with my face, because my face is not, as you can see. And many of the people who were playing with me said, you know what, I don't like them, but you, you are good. <laughs> Meaning what? Meaning what? Something which is essential in academia. This being together, studying together, listening to one another, getting this critical knowledge in university, this is important. Any university where there are not threats among students, nurture, promoting, endorsing, intra and inter cultural dialogue is not going to change. It's not only about getting science, it's getting science and viewpoints. Because there is no science without viewpoint. It's how do you get that? How do you get that? So this is why we need students who are involved in this. And my problem with many Muslim students is that when they come as a Muslim student organization, they speak about Islam. Yeah? Speak about everything. Interface, intercultural, intercivilizational, whatever. Connecting. This is a complex world, but this is where, if we are serious about this, we have to get there. Now, you might have your degree and exams are coming. How much time do you allocate in your student life to mutual knowledge? Hmm. Not in books, because you know what? I'm a book. Sometimes you have to, some people, they, they, they like to read books about others. I'm a book, read me. You have this in, our, in, in English, read me. And if you don't understand, say, I can't read him. <laughs> you don't get that. So this is why mutual knowledge is important. First, deep and structural knowledge. Mutual knowledge where something, and sometimes you're not going to get the degree on that. Sometimes you will, but sometimes you don't. Students are not only assessed by the marks they get. And if you think that this is your student life and say, okay, that's, that's the time where you have time. You have time to take time to mutual knowledge, to take time to understand better other human beings that are coming. You, have, you know, I was talking to the students here. Somebody, uh, some are coming from Eastern Europe, from India, from from Africa, and, and we don't take this as something which is knowledge. This is knowledge, informal, very valuable knowledge. And sometimes there are things that are more valuable than the mark that you will get. You understand? In depth. Now, the third thing which is important here, which what uh, I was talking about at the beginning, is I just wrote a book with one of the, the you know, I, I met many, many philosophers and thinkers. This is one of the greatest French philosophers and anthropologists uh, I met, and it's acknowledged as such. His name is uh, Edgar Morin. If you heard about him, he wrote this philosophy, the, 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 he wrote this method about complexity. He's the one with the mind. And in fact, we were talking about this, and he's a scientist at the same time, huge knowledge. And I was saying something which we agree on, is the problem that we have with our university now, and with knowledge now, is what we call the fragmentation of knowledge. As I was saying at the beginning, there are specialists, but there are no limits. And when there is no link between knowledge, this fragmentation is problematic. Because in fact, you can be very successful in one field, but if you look at that field, it might be that you are acting against the, 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 the common good. Some scientists are in fact in their field, if there is no vision, a vision, and the vision is about what? What is transdisciplinary approach? A transdisciplinary approach is always starting with what I said at the beginning. Ask yourself why. What is the purpose of this company? Is it to get money? Why are you serving at the end? Because you cannot sit down here and say, I'm against, and then you are serving, you know, transnational pharmaceutical uh, uh, corporation, and some of them, they, are, they refuse to give generic uh, medicines in South Africa, and you have people being killed every day out of date. That's also a responsibility. So to get into this, to understand where you are, you need a transdisciplinary approach. As much as we need mutual knowledge, we need to have students who are opening up beyond their field, beyond their knowledge, beyond their specialization to get 
uh, transdisciplinary approach based on the goals, the ends. What do you want with your partnership? So this is something that is your responsibility. You're not looking to get it here. Because we have very, we don't have much space in our universities today to get this. It's happening, but it's not enough. What we see and what I saw in my lab is some students are doing it well. They try to get knowledge, they try to connect, they come with the philosophical question, with the, the spiritual question, they try to say, okay, what are we doing here? For my survey, with my economic skills, for example, I'm serving, you know, uh, transnational corporations. For my for, uh, uh, working for, this is also, because beyond the fact that you get a degree to get a job, there is which type of job are you going to get? And how are you going to get this? So to act and to resist this fragmentation of knowledge is important. In, as I said, science and medicine is something which is also important. The last thing that I, I, uh, I wanted to, to say here is that it's, it's, it's an institution and students are getting knowledge. And there is something that you will find in all the philosophies. Remember when Socrates and uh, 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 he was questioning the people around him. He was always behind his question about something which was very important. It is the concept of useful knowledge. And if you go to all the spiritualities, agnostic or, or, or ages or monotheistic religion, there is also something that in the Arab tradition and never. And even the relationship that we have with God is that we are asking you useful knowledge. Useful knowledge means what? Is give me the knowledge that is going to serve the fourth thing that I said at the beginning, serving humanity. I want to serve humanity. So the knowledge, and once again, whatever is your field, how are you going to translate this into the useful knowledge? And this is why there is also something which is important, that the first danger that we have with students is this elitist approach, that we get the knowledge, we are educated, we have the degree, we like, by the way, doctors, doctor, professors, we like that, that's good. But these are only titles. At the end, the question, and the big question is, how do you, you are useful within the society? So this is why any university, and this was the case in Greece. This was the case in many of the first universities that we have uh, 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 in the Middle East, for example. In Africa, space of knowledge are connected to the society, the surrounding society. So we need also to connect our society with our cities, not to have ivory tower, but this connection is important. Once I was invited to teach in Rotterdam, and they invited me as a, as a visiting professor, and I said, that's fine, and they had something which was very interesting, it was the municipality and the university, is to try to connect the two on diversity and citizenship. And this is where we need to have students that are within the university, but connecting with the society, to, be, to have a useful presence. Our knowledge should be useful, and this is why we have to be active. And what does it mean? It means, for example, to care about the people, to care about the needy people, to care about this solidarity approach is to transform our knowledge. Is what do you give with your knowledge? You have some who are uh, 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 getting education and around you, in your uh, 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 neighborhood, for example, some they don't know how to be in Switzerland. They have, they have this functional uh, uh, illiteracy that is there. How much do you give to the people? How much do you give to the poor? How much do you give to people who are in need of knowledge that you have and you are not connecting university with city? That's a very important responsibility. This is a student. A student is this, is deep and structured knowledge, mutual knowledge, transdisciplinary knowledge, and useful knowledge. So this full qualification of knowledge, this is the starting point of a student life. But it means that you should stop being obsessed with marks, degrees, and I do this to get the job. And this is where an, a student is by definition active. The last things that I wanted to say, just to come to my conclusion, is connecting this with what you said as well at the beginning. And uh, this is where all this 
should be done in the light of what we are expecting from students is critical knowledge, is question. And the problem that they have here that when we are so focused in our field as, for example, professors, we have to do this. Uh, and this is why, for example, for, from the beginning, for the last 30 years, I was involved in education. But there is something that I never stopped, is to be connected to the society, to, to travel the world, to be with people, to be with people because my knowledge is only about people serving people and caring about people. If not, there is no use, there is no uh, goal in this. But the point here is also critical thinking. And critical thinking, once again, is what you can get from the university sometimes that you don't get in spiritual and religious community. And it is the other way around. I met with some traditionalists and literalists and people who are very conservative in religious uh, settings. And they said, you know what, in the past it was better. Because our kids, they were just listening to us and they were following. It's as if questioning is wrong. I said that's the opposite. This is a great opportunity to question and to come with the question. This critical thinking, it's essential. But it means that uh, 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 you dare question and your own professors. And this is from some, sometimes things that I, I don't see enough with students. They are so obsessed with the degree that they stop questioning. They are not critical. The best teachers I have, and the best teachers, you know the last book, after 37 years, I met the teacher who was at the beginning of my secondary school, and I dedicated the, the book to him 37 years later. I met him at the book fair in, in Switzerland last year, and I was crying when I met him. You know why? Because he was so much upsetting me. <laughs> he was saying things in, during the lessons that was just, he was targeting people and targeting me, saying, that, do you think that this is right? That's completely wrong. And he was questioning many of the things that I believe were right. And I was going back home to the wall tomorrow, I will mean, answer. And I started reading because of him, because he was upsetting me. I never forget this, this teacher. Why? Because he taught me critical thinking, as I'm going to challenge him. And out of respect, because the way he was doing it was out of respect, but in the way which was very, I think that within university students should get that critical thinking. Come with and there, ask the questions and, and think by yourself. I'm sorry to say that too many of the students that I, 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 I meet are saying, I think by myself, but they, are, they have this tendency to think as many others. By myself, but there is a trend, a fashion. And I think that this is what university, this is what we are expecting. And this helps Muslims, for example, also to be able, within the religious community, or Jews, within the religious community, or even atheists, because sometimes some atheists are coming with a sense of an arrogance, I think, as if you don't. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, I would doubt, it's as if doubting, it's a, it's a sign of open, you know, some people are doubting so much that they are dogmatic with their doubt. <laughs> In the way they doubt, they say, I, I have some doubts as well, how about your own doubt? So, <laughs> the point here is this critical thinking, it's, it's important. Because critical thinking is the way you get the sense of uh, there is no critical thinking without one thing that I would like the students to get. It's not always to talk. Critical thinking starts with listening. Listen. You are asked to give, to be evaluated and to assess and you will get the mark. But before that, the quality of your listening in student, because this is what we have subject, and subject learn to listen. This, the, 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 the second thing that I, uh, it's important, as some, some people can change the world, and all this are three, are the ones to change the world. 
it's not, it's, it's how you equip with yourself, with thinking, your mind, your time, your, your, the way you deal with people. This is what I call changing the world. It starts with yourself, it starts with the way you deal with your mind, with the way you are critical with questions and critical with answers. Uh, once again, later, I, one of the, 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 my professor of philosophy in the, the University of Geneva, who was the specialist on Kant, I will never forget him, yeah, never, because he was respectful with my being and critical with my thinking. That's it. Critical with my thinking and respectful with my being. And this is why you have, and I think that students should get that uh, among themselves. The second is self-critical. Self-critical, you know what it means? It means that you are getting something which is needed now. Whoever you are, whatever is your title is what I call intellectual humility. Intellectual humility is, I'm trying my best, but I might be wrong. Self-critical. With your own, you know, culture, with your own spiritual community, with your own religious community, with your own family, with yourself. Meaning that this is, these are skills that you need to get in university, because today we have two much, too many people who are so driven by emotion that they cannot be self-critical. This is a contradiction term. Emotion and self-critical criticism doesn't work, too. don't work, don't go together. So this is why we need to have this uh, sense here, uh, this uh, uh, self-criticism. There is a third thing that I wanted to say here which is also missing in our universities, and I'm challenging on this. You know what I miss more in universities? is courageous students. Courageous. Speaking in a mind. Criticizing, challenging the professors. Challenging even the system. In a constructive way, not by sitting there, it's all bad. <laughs> You know, have you have in the suburbs in France, and people are against the system. Okay, that's fine. Then you look at the way they dress, it's Nike, it's every day the system is there. <laughs> they are the system against the system, and the system is laughing. Okay? But you have students exactly the same. Well, courageous means that also, I'm sorry, you get out of here when, for example, it's an institution. An institution, by definition, is not perfect. There are things that are wrong in a university. You have to go and to say, I'm sorry, there are things that are wrong. There, there are injustices in the way some, for example, the only country, for example, where uh, I cannot speak in a university is not Switzerland, is in France. And you have some students, they went to the, 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 the dean and said, what's that? What is, what, is, what is this? And they are challenged by saying, if you don't do this, it's going to be a problem for you, for your future. So you have some of the students, they keep quiet, I don't want a problem, I don't like to read and my wife, and others who are at one point, but it's not for the people, it's not, who, it's not because of the injustice, it's for the sake of the university itself. If a university ends up not letting voices, this is against freedom of expression, it's bad for the university itself, not for the people. So this is why we need courageous students who are able also to face populists, to face new slavery, to be able to speak out. And it could be that in constructive way you can have in a university political <coughs> views as long well as you let people having their own. That's the point. The point is not mine and then I don't listen, but this uh, courage is something which is uh, uh, important. Uh, in, in that, the last thing that I wanted to say is, is uh, in a university we have organization and we have students. And once again, as I said at the beginning, when you have time to read books, when you have time to interact with others, it's very important. Is it then already? A long time ago. Hmm? Yeah, oh, minus two. <laughs> Swiss terms. That's okay. <laughs> In my cultural origin, Egypt, I still have 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's your job, okay? That's in my job, by the way. Uh, no, so what I want to 
see here is uh, what I was saying is, is also getting uh, uh, students within academia to, to never disconnect uh, what they are doing is getting knowledge with trying to remain human and to, to remain human beings. And this is why, as much as we need courage, we need people, it's, you know, it might be simplistic, it might be uh, uh, disconnect from what you are experiencing, but caring about the people around you, caring about the society, caring about the, 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 the there are things, I don't know if when you, you know, I come back to my country and sometimes when I listen to what is said about immigrants, about foreigners, about poor people, I say, if the students are going to be sad, who is going to talk? If you only you only care about your degree and you don't care about humanity, where are we heading? What's the point? That there is a problem. But it's a, it's it's the, the problem that we are. And once again, we can sit down. You know, for example, when when you listen to what uh, uh, happened in, in the states, and you know, if we, we don't care about such things, and we end up disconnecting our student life from life, there is a problem with life. So this is where I think that within university organizations like yours and others should be involved with this. It doesn't mean that you deny you singularity coming from an Islamic background, a Jewish background, an agnostic, ages background that come together and show that these fundamental values that I was talking about at the beginning are helping you to come together and to be courageous, to be self-critical, and to be also deep and, and disciplined in the way you deal. And there is also something that is coming from university, I would say. We are facing a very big danger, which is the culture of rights. And I would like our university to also add a culture of responsibility. Which is, yes, I have duties as well. Remember what Gandhi said when he got the first draft of the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? It took three months for him to respond when he got the first draft. And he responded, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, I read with uh, interest your draft. My mother told me that with every single right you have, there is a duty. Good. I like that. From our understanding as students within academia, as humanity, university, and humanity, this is something that I think we have to stress and let me complete with four words that I would like to stress coming from this. All what I said is not acting and should not be understood as against expertise. No, I'm not talking about this. I'm not saying this at the price of that. I'm saying this is where our expert, our knowledge should be dressed in a way where we are adding all this qualifying knowledge and not diminishing knowledge. It's, this is why, for example, I would like us within university to keep this sense of curiosity. Curiosity is to see knowledge. And this is what I understood from my faith. Faith is about seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge. Yes, curiosity is important. And if you only study for the degree, this is not curiosity. This is discipline in the wrong way. Curiosity is beyond. It's beyond. It's you know, how many books you read a week. When I am in the university with the tutorial, you come to one tutorial, you have to read four books per week. Read. But once again, it's for the tutorial. What are you reading more than that? So say, oh, I can't, I don't have time. So, Wait till the end of the term, and you read. Actually, not only for the exams. Uh, uh, curiosity, uh, it's important. Humanity, as I said, is something which is so important. And I would say two words that are not very much uh, 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 in our academic setting. Uh, you know, there is something which is called intellectual humility, and there is something which is called intellectual empathy. <laughs> is to put some heart in what you do. It's not going to be marked. It's not going to be seen. It's not going to be assessed by you. That's what it's assessed by you. But this intellectual empathy is the way 
you can, all what I said is intellectual empathy is the type of knowledge. Always questioning the goals, always questioning the ends, always questioning the usefulness of your knowledge. And the last point, uh, the last word that I will keep here is, as I said at the beginning, it's one of the disciplines here is where we are creative. You know, you are talking about the fact that I was talking about the Muslims in the West. I'm also involved with Muslims in Muslim majority countries. I'm saying, you know, what is the main crisis of the Muslim uh, uh, contemporary conscience and mind? Is lack of preaching. Lack of preaching. Thinking outside the box. But you know what I would say for the Swiss citizens? Lack of preaching. It's an international disease. We get too much and we create or we are creating too less than not enough. Close. And I think that this is not helping us. And, and this is the defeat of knowledge if we are not facing this the right way. And this is the way I would uh, respond to the question that was put to me about the, the student stuff today. Thank you. <coughs>
if you go for that, you understand that this is where you question the goals, you question your own understanding, you have it, and this is the wisdom which is based on the ethical ground. And we need this, we need to reconnect science and ethics. But not only, by the way, knowledge and ethics at, at uh, all levels. The second is, uh, uh, I was, you know, I'm here in Switzerland, in your university, I was addressing this, where you are, you are the forefront of uh, contemporary academic uh, knowledge in this university. That's the reality that it's evolving very fast, very quickly. So you need to be equipped with all that. Now, if you look at other uh, societies with uh, 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 different cultures, I would, I would be uh, cautious with this, you know, essentialization of culture and religion by saying, uh, uh, culture is not helping to uh, the development of knowledge, for example. I say that there are other factors. Sometimes the way we deal with culture could be that's true. For example, there is something which now we know. Uh, these are facts, by the way, and I, I would like some of my uh, fellow uh, Muslim uh, 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 brothers and sisters here to get it right. We know now, and these are facts based on sociology, anthropology, and also neuroscience. That in fact, uh, if you look at uh, the development of society, it relies a lot on the participation and the involvement of women. And on part, in patriarchal cultures, the fact that women are not involved is not helping the development of knowledge and development of uh, new how. And this is the reality. Now we can see that, uh, uh, for example, when we, you are pushing, for example, look at all the statistics in the West with men and women in education. Women are doing better. Almost transversal. And especially when people are coming from uh, uh, southern country. For example, uh, uh, coming from, uh, I'm not going to mention countries, but uh, <laughs> I can tell you Egypt, because I'm coming from there, uh, but that's the reality. Add to this things that are very important when it comes to uh, mastering the, 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 the fields and being involved and the seriousness. You can even see that in many. Uh, enterprises, companies, and even Muslim organizations, uh, women are much more involved and they are, are helping the department. So it could be that some cultural features are not helping uh, progress in knowledge or in technology, for example. Uh, uh, when I was involved in Senegal and in the uh, sub saharan countries uh, about development and agriculture, we have statistics and showing that if you give, for example, the same slot to a woman, to a man, the productivity coming from a woman is the triple. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the end. So, so you have a commitment here that it's very important that there's a problem in the way, even in patriarchal culture. And this is why, for example, in the book Radical Reform, I say there is no religion without culture. There is no culture without religion. That religion is not culture. And sometimes, in the name of principles, we have to be people of some cultural reading. It's not helping to promote education for all. And this is uh, uh, something that we have to change. And by the way, you know, all these big things that we have in the Islamic tradition, that uh, women are more emotional than men? Wrong. <laughs> Neuroscience are saying exactly the opposite. In fact, there's something which is very interesting that you have to know, especially when you are married. <laughs> uh, that's all. Is that in fact, women, because the brain are not working the same, the brain are not working the same. In fact, women are less emotional than men. Men are more emotional than women. Do you know the difference? Is that women are less em are less emotional, but they talk more. <laughs> Men are more emotional, but they talk less. They think that they are protecting themselves by being silent. And they are very fragile and very vulnerable. But this is science, by the way. It's, it's, and then, if you get this, you understand that uh, we might have to reassess some of our opinion. Just asking, I understand that concerning more the cultural so. If you give the same problem like men, women do better in a given field than men, for example, just give it a different cultural running to it. 
Will it do it in result? That's a more important Of course, thing. yes, it, it will. So this is why you have to take into account the cultural, you have to take into account the social, the social setting, the, the, the classes, the, 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 the level within the society. But this is why the university, uh, when, for example, you know, I was very critical uh, of the Sudanese regime. But I was very interested by the Minister of Education. This was in the 90s. Why? Because they were creating universities in every region connected to the reality around. You have to look at the situation, the cultural situation, the social situation, the, the, the mapping the reality. So these are things that you cannot decide here. Now we were talking about Switzerland, about you as students here. But uh, you are right. We have to adapt. We have to connect this to the real uh, uh, question that we can get in the ground. So next question. Yeah, I would like to. Uh, I will try my best to be very uh, precise and direct in my question. Uh, you have been talking about uh, critical thinking, and I believe critical thinking comes uh, automatically uh, as a result also of uh, freedom of expression. So in countries uh, where the tax of freedom of expression is too high, and where you find fundamentalist groups, or you find uh, people who are culturally uh, not uh, accepting freedom of expression, uh, so what would you uh, suggest, or what would you say, what would be, in your opinion, the solution? For example, uh, we have been uh, witnessing uh, uh, in the Middle East uh, lots of actions against uh, threats against intellectuals, against students for just having different opinion. So, and this which hunting of the, the other thoughts, the other the person who's different. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that the answer is already in your question. Uh, I have, you know, very often the people uh, on my take on this, they are saying, you know what, he's controversial. He was dying from the state, 10 months from the France, uh, from some universities in, in, the, in, the, in the, as I said, in France. And it's as if this is the, 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 the controversial dimension. It's not said that I was bad from six Muslim majority countries for years and up to now. Why? Because this is exactly what I was saying. By the way, I was banned from the states because under the Bush administration, and once again, I'm always repeating this, to be banned from the states under the Bush administration is a great honor. That <laughs> but the point here is that because I was saying that uh, Palestinian and uh, Iraqi was legitimate in their resistance. I disagree with the means. I think that it will never be justified for all kill civilians, but it's legitimate to resist uh, uh, military. And it was, this is what I said, this is why the CCR was unable. But what I also said in Tunisia is that Ben Ali was a dictator, that uh, Mubarak was a dictator, that uh, Bashar is a dictator, that, and this is what we have to be consistent. Freedom of expression, and you, as you, instead of just sitting and saying we want freedom of expression for all this to struggle. I myself, when I was a student, for all my years of uh, 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 being a student, I was involved in the campaign uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the, the, the resistance in South Africa, against Africa. And this was based on freedom. It was not only about Mandela, Mandela was a symbol, but it was about apartheid and racism. And I think that what we need now to have coming from students is also to be able to, with no selective approach, freedom of expression and freedom should be the same in African countries, in Middle Eastern countries, in Iran that I was criticizing, in, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I was saying from the beginning, I'm sorry, there is no right for government to impose onto women who are the headscarf, for example. They should be free to do whatever they want. And I'm saying to France, you have no right to impose it to women to take it up. This is an act of faith that the people decide for themselves and don't decide. So this is freedom. And this is why we have to stand. I paid the price for this. I was bad and still is from Saudi Arabia. Because this country is a country where it's not possible to speak your mind. In Qatar, where I'm working, I said it as a condition, I'm going to speak out. And what you are doing to migrant workers, domestic workers, is new slavery. We never accept that. So you pay the price for this, and this is what I call courage. Courage. It means speaking.
speak your mind, but be consistent not to speak for some and use it for some others. The problem I have with some French intellectuals is that they are so, so powerful speaking about Libya, uh, Egypt, uh, and then when it comes to Israel and Palestinians, no, I'm sorry, consistency. The life of the Palestinians is as valuable as the life of anybody else on earth. Consistency is the way we deal with freedom. So I completely agree with you. We have to be critical and we have to be uh, clear on that. And I would like students to be involved in this discussion in a constructive way. The point is not only to target countries, the way it's to change the situation, to help to change the situation. So networks of students that we had in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s are lost now. It's as if the students they don't care about us. They can speak, they don't. So, as they can speak and they don't, they're not going to support students that can't speak. So, this is something which is a kind of, uh, I'm sorry to say, too many, too much laziness from the part of students when it comes to fundamental rights and freedom of expression is an essential one. Culture is counting. The human culture 
is evaluating on the basis of principle and in depth. One culture, the consumerist culture, is consume and, and count. And the other culture, the humanist culture, the spiritual culture, the culture that we, the principles that we have covered, it's not about count. And then what I can tell you, yes, the journalists, for example. I met so many journalists that I'm not going to trust by the way they do their job. But I met others who never forgot are not forgetting why they are journalists that they are human beings, that they have a responsibility. They are mediators between reality and, and people, and they understand that the way they are going to talk about things. So if with you and you are doing, as a professor, as a teacher, you can remind the people of their responsibility. That's the point. So I think that the starting point of student life is never lose hope by counting, but get commitment by striving and serving. That's the point I would like, because I'm sorry, what we are all in danger, all of us, all of us, even, you know, I'm not talking about the West here. If you go to some southern countries, you can see something which is this global world culture or consumerist culture that is everywhere. That at the end, even our struggle for humanity is based on, on you know, a culture that is idealizing people. Idealizing. You know what we did with Nelson Mandela? For so many years, he was a terrorist. And at the end, what he told the people was not that he was an icon for giving, that he was consistent at the end. What I like in him is he never betrayed the principle. I'm not going to forget the people, the black, I'm not going to forget the Palestinians, I'm not going to forget. Even though you are using me as an icon, my principles are my principles. I'm going to be consistent. He was a man of courage, till the end. Even though it, when he was used by the media, and then uh, even the United States of America, they were supporting the apartheid system, they used him. And he was able to say, I forgive you, but my principles are my principles, I'm not to be is that I'm not to be so. So I think that this is where, this is the culture that I would like to have. This is where I think students should get it right and humans should get it right. That at the end, yes, media can destroy everything. So what? Find the people, get the work done, and do what you have to do. Even with your paper, even with your books, when you are writing books, you are writing a paper, an exam, you are doing this, you are doing the best you can. And then. Uh, you use this for the best of your uh, capacity and the best of your knowledge. So, so this is also something that it's good that I'm ending with this because with your last question, you are talking about one essential thing is never lose hope. That's the, the, the way it is. To, to be a student is to get the degree, to get uh, the knowledge and not to lose hope in humanity. Even though Humanity is uh, sometimes disappointed. It is. Humans are very disappointed. And the first that should disappoint you is yourself. Thank you.